did on channel one. We're going to start the bed now. So I'm going to start the bed. Okay, I'd like to welcome you all uh, this morning for our um, uh, workshop on best common practices uh, for building internet capacity. And um <coughs> It's um, um, uh, the workshop falls under the theme of internet governance for development, and it's uh, it is organized by um <coughs> by Rife NCCF UNIC and uh, the Arab IGF Secretariat. So I um, I start by thanking you all for your interest and uh, for coming uh, early this morning. And I'm sorry for uh, the delay in starting. Obviously, uh, it's been a long queue for going in. Um <coughs> Uh, uh, the objective of our workshop uh, today is actually uh, to look uh, closer uh, at the importance of capacity building in uh, growing the overall uh, internet. So, um, and I'm, I'm maybe I'd like to start with um, sharing um, uh, my personal experience from uh, the Arab um, IGF meeting, which uh, took place uh, last month in Kuwait, and. Uh, so many stakeholders came together for the first time to talk about uh, the interest um, in the Arab region about uh, uh, internet governance. And um, one uh, common take from this conference is that uh, uh, capacity building is an, a very important thing that uh, we all need to look very um, seriously at. And um, for all the topics that were uh, discussed, uh, uh, capacity building seemed to be uh, a cross-cutting priority. And um, and um, therefore, it's um, here comes our interest actually to uh, organize such a workshop, and uh, uh, we're thankful to our co-organizers, to RIFE, NCC, and to AFUNIC for facilitating this, and to our panelists today. Uh, we have actually a quite uh, a diverse panel in terms of um, uh, regions, uh, gender, and also stakeholder groups. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, speakers uh, from. Uh, uh, European region, from uh, the um, uh, uh, Latin region, and from Asia Pacific, and so um, uh, so I think we're uh, we're going to have a good uh, panel. And uh, most of our panelists are um, very engaged in uh, capacity building programs and uh, in uh, uh, building calibers around internet governance. So I hope we will be discussing um, different dimensions of capacity building. Um, from whether we're talking about technical trainings, uh, bu um, building the infrastructure, training uh, training the direction in that direction, or if we're talking about uh, policies and internet uh, uh, governance uh, policies. So, um, <coughs> so uh, maybe I, um, I I will ask our panelists to uh, to start their presentation, and uh, I would uh, kindly ask them to maybe. Uh, give us a hint on uh, uh, what are uh, the most important uh, uh, issues that need to be addressed in terms of uh, uh, how public-private par partnerships, for example, uh, are effective or maybe a challenge in capacity building. How is the multi-stakeholder balance uh, achieved? Uh, is, is there a, um, a need for different uh, directed uh, capacity building programs if we talk about different regions or different stakeholder groups? So uh, without further uh, two introductions, I will uh, start by introducing our um, first speaker today. And our first speaker is um, Olga, Olga Cavalli. Um, Olga is um, the advisor to the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Argentina, and she's also a university teacher in the Universidad of Buenos Aires. Um, one important issue is that Olga is the director and main leader of the South School on Internet Governance, so very relevant to uh, training in that direction. And she's also the president of the Commission of Women Engineers for Development. Uh, so, Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, Paul and Chris. And thank you for the panel. I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, why we thought about the school for Latin America? Um, capacity building is important, but Latin America has another challenge, which is increasing relevant participation from the region in these processes. For different reasons, not many people come here. It's a long way. 
it's very expensive to pay a ticket to come to Baku from Buenos Aires. It's, it's not only expensive, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And you have to spend like two days to go and two days to come back. The same to go to nice Sharm el Sheikh, uh, IGF, and the same will be to go to Indonesia and was also Lithuania. So what happens is that Latin America is not so much represented in these spaces, but there are different ways that you can participate. You can send a paper, you can remote participate as panelists or making questions, but people just don't know. So what we found in the region is that there is an interesting critical mass of people to motivate them to participate, but they had no idea that this exists and why they should be spending their money in a ticket or their time or convincing their bosses at the government or th at their organizations or at their companies that this is a relevant space for what? For internet, for development, what is important for them, for those countries in Latin America to come, he to come here. So we thought that this was something that the region was, was needing a space where they could understand how internet is coordinated, how internet works, which is the relevance of the infrastructure, which is the relevance of the critical internet resources, internet at the addresses, um, root servers, which is the role of different organizations, RARs, IANA, ICANN, why they should go to an ICANN meeting, and uh, why all these acronyms strange to them should be relevant for their countries oh. and for their organizations. So this is why we thought that this space was needed and we started very timidly in Buenos Aires in 2009. We also what we realized is that we needed to help people to attend. We, we granted fellowship to all the students from the very beginning. So they don't have to pay, they have to pay the ticket, but we pay f the rest. We pay the accommodation, all the course, all the materials and also the social activities. Because if not, they won't come and uh, we, we started with 26 uh, students from the whole region, six from Argentina and 20 from the whole Latin America, from different countries. And uh, it went very well, it was only three days, so we decided to move forward. And thanks to many companies and organizations that have helped us, this is done thanks to the cooperation of different stakeholders, a total multi-stakeholder, multi-private um, sector and, and, and also um, government uh, help and especially RIPE has been uh, our contributor several times with speakers uh, sponsoring students, sponsoring the school as well. So thank you very much for that. And um, we don't have a main sponsor. We have several small sponsors that make a big whole thing. So we started with that and we grew from there to uh, another decision. Should we do it in Buenos Aires every year? Because it's a nice city, it's a city where I live it's a city where everyone wants to go, but it's far away in the south. So for Latin Americans, it's also challenging to be in Buenos Aires. So we said, no, let's rotate. Let's go country by country and allow people from each country to come to the training. So second one was Sao Paulo with our host was the CGRDR, the, the local CCTLD and the Comité Gestor de Internet. And then uh, there were we had more students, 38, all of them received a uh, fellowship. And then we went to Mexico and we had 70 students. And there it was the ISP, the Chamber of ISPs and the Ministry of Economy, our host. And then we went to Colombia this year. And what happened in Colombia was very remarkable. The Ministry of ICTs thought that was interesting. And he told us if he could bring people from all over Colombia. And we said, we don't have budget for that. <laughs> we cannot bring 100 people or 80 people from all over Colombia. But he said, well, I, I will bring those students and you bring the Latin American ones. So he, 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 he supported people, well, the ministry supported people from every small municipality or big municipality in the whole country to attend the program. And so it became really a huge, a huge group of people, very diverse with a lot of people from Latin America and from Colombia. And now there are several Colombians already engaged in the process. Th this year, for the first time, there was a guy in the GAC, in the, in the Governmental Advisory Committee, who was a student of the school. So that's the purpose. Um, it's a program that requires a lot of work, 
but at the same time, it's extremely rewarding once you see all the people engaged in ICANN fellowships, in the uh, ISOC ambassadors, then they start, they, some of them have started uh, ISOC chapters and some are engaged in s different chapters. So I think we have slowly but surely we are achieving a relevant participation from the region and involvement of them in these discussions. That's the, a little bit of the story. I don't know if I responded your questions or, or if you want to ask uh, something else. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Olga. I think that is um, um, very uh, inspiring to other regions as well because uh, from... Yeah. One more comment I forgot. From the very beginning, we decided to have simultaneous translation English, Spanish all the time, which is for the, for the budget is extremely challenging. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing myself. Oh yeah, no. So that that was a decision that it was difficult to take because it's very expensive, but at the same time it was very enabling because the teachers that come from Europe or from the United States or from other regions that do speak English can give their presentations. People in Latin America say they speak English, but when the time comes and you have a speaker in front, they don't get the message. So, and we 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 kept that every year. And it's very expensive, but I think it's we, we are convinced that language is a barrier. And, and of course, you have to learn languages, but if you don't, don't know them, you have to, n you need the, the translation. So, um, so I take, um, I take uh, as challenges funding and uh, translation uh, language barriers, and but I, but I think opportunities are <coughs> actual uh, participation between public sector and uh, private sector. And of course, the building of future uh, leaders, uh, which is which is a great thing, I um, I would say. <coughs> um, so thank you very much, uh, Olga. And um, we do have a, a speaker missing today, uh, which is uh, Pavel. So I apologize for that. Uh, so uh, um <coughs> I'll, I'll I'm I'm open actually if anyone would like to put questions to the different speakers as we go. Just raise your hand, and I can interrupt. Let's make it a. Um, flexible discussion as we go. So um, um, uh, I will turn to Paul as our next uh, speaker. Uh, Paul is the Director of External Relations uh, for uh, RIFE NCC, and um, he is responsible at RIFE for the public relations and for outre outreach activities. He's also <coughs> um, a founder of the Middle East Network Operators Group, and, uh, and I think, Paul, uh, you can uh, maybe give us uh, the other side of uh, capacity building, which is actually directed towards uh, technical training, and I know you have a, a long uh, experience in that. So. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Christine said, I'm Paul Rendek from the, from the RIFE NCC. Um, I'm, g I'm actually going to attempt to, to show you um, what we have done to actually uh, further capacity building in the Middle East region. Uh, I am uh, based now in Dubai. Um, our office is, is based in Amsterdam, but of course we cover a region of 76 countries, so you can imagine that, that we're quite busy uh, running around to each spot, as, as Olga has mentioned. So when you start to work on capacity building programs, how do you reach a region when you are covering 76 countries and you are responsible to make sure that, that the coordination of, of the IP addresses there is handled um, really in a, in, a, in, a, in a good manner. So from a technical capacity perspective, what we've done is we started an initiative and that was to provide hands-on IPv6 training. So the RIPE NCC teamed up with MENOG, the Middle East Network Operators Group, and APNIC, the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. Uh, it is our counterpart, our, our, our sister RIR in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we produced a set of, of uh, material for a five-day training course on IPv6, hands-on IPv6, because, of course, as uh, many of you here in the room know, uh, we no longer, as the RIPE NCC, have any IPv4 free pool of address space left. So it's very important that our region, which includes uh, Europe, uh, Russia, Central Asia, and the Middle East, um, is actually moving to IPv6. There really is no choice for the further development of, uh, of the internet and, and making sure that we bring on uh, new uh, people onto the internet. As you can well imagine, the corridor, Russia, Central Asia, down into the Middle East, has explosive growth of internet currently. 
Um, so this doesn't come at a very great time that we've run out of these IPv4 resources. So one of the things that the technical community wanted to do is say, right, okay, we need to look at capacity building and real efforts we can do uh, so that we can actually have some good technical trainings and exchange this information. So what have we done? We've devised something called the IPv6 Roadshow, which is what I just talked about, uh, uh, the, the course that we've built there. Uh, and we've pioneered this in, in the Middle East region. This is, this is fantastic. It's the first time that our organizations have gone into this kind of training where we've, we're giving five-day hands-on workshop trainings for IPv6 so that those uh, engineers that, that come to these courses can walk away and understand how they would actually deploy IPv6 in their network. Now, how you do that strategically is another point, but technically, we need to make sure that the capacity is there so that these networks can operate. So I think, basically, this is the first initiative that we did um, in, in a true kind of multi-stakeholder fashion. What we did is instead of going and training uh, the technical staff of our customer base, because, of course, we know them and we have relations with them, we decided to team up with governments in the region and have the governments actually host these IPv6 roadshows locally in, in any particular country in the Middle East. And we, from the technical community, would provide the material and the trainers free of charge. This is actually the gift from the Middle East Network Operators Group and the technical community to the region. So we thought that this was a great multi-stakeholder effort where we have governments that would invite those people and, and select those engineers from, 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 you know, the, from the public sector and also from um, from uh, uh, enterprise such as banking and what have you that aren't really probably used to working with the technical community like the RIPE NCC. Um, so these people run very large networks and they probably don't have the, the connections that we have uh, when you're talking about ISP to ISP in the region. So we felt that in order for all the different stakeholders to make sure they were for ready for IPv6, we wanted to do this effort together with, with governments. It has been very successful. We've provided these training courses pretty much in, in, in every country in the Middle East so far. But we're taking this a step further now. And this is what I think is, is true capacity building. It's fabulous that we can go into a country and, and, and provide a couple of workshops and train you know, some 30 to 60 people. But that is not enough. I think for true capacity building, we needed to find something where we can actually spread the information in, in, into any particular country much further and leave the intelligence there for them to be able to provide these trainings further on. So what we're now working on, I'm very happy actually that, that, that we have built some great relationships with, with um, governments uh, in the Middle East, with uh, either regulatory bodies or with ministries, and we've provided these kinds of trainings. They, like I said, they're very popular. But the next step now is that we've actually been talking to the uh, UAE government and the Lebanese government, and they showed so much interest in working together with the technical community to develop a train the trainer course. Now this is something we think is actually going to really take off because if we can train trainers locally and give them the material from the technical community to use, then we truly have capacity building efforts uh, that can come there. So I'm happy again that we're pioneering this in the Middle East. Be very careful, Central Asia and Russia is hot on our tails. They're asking us to actually translate this uh, course into Russian and we're working with the likes of Cisco and partnering with other industry partners in Central Asia and in Russia, and we will be actually rolling out the IPv6 into these regions as well. So this is where I think, this is one example, it's only one of course, but it's, it's, it's a great example of where a public-private sector cooperation can really work, because I would never have the reach inside of, of, of local government in any one uh, country to actually go and find these engineers that need to have this training. So I think when you have this kind of cooperation, you can get much more done. So I'm very happy about that. Thank you, Paul. Um, this sounds um, uh, quite interesting, and um, and maybe I, I'd like to suggest uh, that um, um, maybe speakers or panelists can make available some information on um, on how to be contacted for specific programs, because I think that would be uh, interesting to exchange uh, from one region to the other and possibly attend. Uh, um, in Egypt, for example, we've had actually uh, a participant to the um, to our first summer school, uh, which is actually. Uh, uh, no, no, to the to the summer school which was in Europe, which was organized. Uh, he organized then the summer school in Egypt, and uh, uh, then joined the technical community as uh, uh, an employee of a specific organization. And so it's. Uh, I think this is how actually leaders are uh, 
uh, built. And um, but my question to you would be, what are the challenges maybe that you're facing in that? Because that all sounds so great, but I'm yeah. sure you've uh, had some challenges. Oh dear, here come the challenges. Um, of course, we've had challenges along the way. You know, for us, uh, the, the technical community, and really, I mean, I'm coming based from, mostly from initiatives that we've done in Europe. Uh, we've always been a, a, a very multi-stakeholder and open uh, community. So for us to work in this kind of environment uh, together in the technical community, this is something we've been doing for ages. So this is nothing new for us. But I can tell you, I've had huge challenges in the Middle East because you know, and, and especially with government, I can say, because government certainly does is not used to working in this multi-stakeholder environment or in any kind of a bottom-up process. Of course, government is, is top-down, and that's fine. I think the challenge that we've had is, is finding the ways and working together where we're coming with all this enthusiasm with this bottom-up uh, process and, and working in a very informal way, and we're, er, and we're reaching governments that have certain uh, op uh, modes of, of operation and ways that they're, that they're working and I think sometimes we clash to the point where you know it was a little bit rocky at the start I think that once you overcome that um, and you build the relationship because you see the, 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 the thing that we found is getting there finding the relationship finding out the reason why something like this would be interesting was a much bigger hurdle than actually providing the courses itself once you get there so I think that that it, it's it's it was reaching the right uh, area inside the governments having them understand that we can work in this in this way together and it doesn't have to maybe even be over formalized but breaking that barrier has been has has been quite a long road in getting this off the ground so and I and I have to say that although we do have a lot of successes I still still have some of these barriers that I have to jump over and I'm I'm still have some governments looking at us wondering why we would have this relationship or, or they they are not used to that multi state stakeholder environment so for them it's it's very e it's very difficult to even sign off to have something like this happen inside their administrations so I think that this is is something that takes a lot of time so uh, we are certainly spending a lot of effort here so raising the interest on the public side okay um, our, our next speaker is uh, Salam, Salam Yamut. Salam is uh, National ICT Strategy Coordinator at the Presidency of the Council of Ministers in uh, Lebanon. And uh, uh, Salam handles uh, the innovation and ICT portfolios for the Prime Minister's Office in Beirut. Uh, she's, also in, she's also been long involved in ICT strategies uh, and ICT for development programs and is the founder of uh, Women in IT. Salam, maybe um, you uh, you have you have coordinated uh, and uh, programs for the youth involvement in the Arab IGF and uh, and um, coming from the um, public uh, sector, I think um, you can talk to us about um, how tr uh, trainings and capacity buildings are actually uh, something that can motivate participation in public forums like the uh, global IGF or even in regional forums like. Uh, uh, the Arab IGF. Thank you, Christine. Yes, I want to start by, uh, of course, thanking uh, you, but uh, I would like to start from where Paul left. It is very difficult, uh, in my experience in Lebanon, for the government to think differently because we are so much used to making decisions, and these decisions become reg regulation or law. So when we started actually getting into, we, we started getting into the multi-stakeholder approach out of a need because we were feeling that the policies we were making were very much far away from the needs of the citizens and of the private companies. So, and then we discovered that by listening to their needs, by going to open forums like this one, it's actually a country, it's a way for us to shape better ideas and better policies for the future. So when uh, we were first approached, you know, uh, by, by RIPE to do the first training, so the government uh, was saying, oh, we're going to put our logo next to RIPE's logo. <laughs> Why? <laughs> we're going to pay for it, and they're going to bring only the trainers. Why? So it's, it's a different mentality. But when we finally got to, to show them that there is a need and a demand, and uh, th the first workshop, we had 15 government employees and 15 service providers head to head in the, in the training. And then uh, nine months later, today, now we are making our, we are organizing our new uh, 
IPv6 uh, training, and this time we have the Association of Banks, which the first time did, Im did not invite one person after we have spent like a month and a half talking to them for co-sponsoring and for bringing people. They, I think, brought us only one person. Uh, this today, I mean, last week, we were uh, informed that they wanted to become co-sponsors, and they're taking over to bring uh, 10 representatives from the banks. So now we have the banks on board, we have the public sector on board, we have the uh, service providers on board, and of course, uh, the training is done in partnership between the government, the Internet Society of Lebanon, and RIPE NCC. So uh, it's it led naturally to doing the IPv6 task force. Since all these people were, were cooperating to do the training, then it made perfect sense for the same people to continue to form the first IPv6 task force for the country, which will have representatives from all the sectors involved to do the changes. So th that's what I wanted to say. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to say is this multi-stakeholder approach, we took it on, like now all the committees that we are forming for the laws, we are making sure that we're including in the committees of the writing of the laws individuals from the private sector and uh, from the civil society. This is a new thing in Lebanon. Also, we are publicizing all our laws and policies on the websites for, for information. So once we got into doing the, the first time was the hardest time, like everything. <laughs> Once we got into the, the, the mind frame of doing the multi-stakeholders approach, now we, we see it everywhere. We're incorporating it in, in so many different ways. And it's actually turned out to be an added value for the government because we really know what's going on and we understand the needs and we're able to tailor policies based on these specific needs. Thank you very much, Salam. And um, m maybe one question to, to, to further um, understand. Uh, do you think it's also doable to extend such training and capacity building programs beyond the internet community to other communities that are very relevant to the internet public policy? Or is this something, yeah? And this, this is a very good point, Christine, of course, I think. Uh, I haven't thought about it yet because it's not within my portfolio. And because I think maybe the internet community is already multi-stakeholder. I mean, we live it every year in the IGF. But it's, a, it's an excellent idea. Yeah, we should try. Okay, um, thank you, Salam. And um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Constance Bommelaer uh, from the Internet Society. Uh, Constance is the Director for Public Policy at the Internet Society. Uh, she's working uh, on developing partnerships with international organizations as well as strategic positions on key internet uh, issues. And um, she's been involved in uh, next generation leader programs and uh, uh, youth programs um, uh, uh, dedicated into uh, preparing business uh, policy and internet technology leaders. Uh, Constance, I know uh, the internet is, um, has a long history in capacity building and in uh, raising awareness about internet public policies and, uh, and I know um, INET conferences um, have been um, very popular. I remember INET conferences at uh, uh, the early stages of the internet have um, uh, in Egypt, for example, uh, we used to benefit very much of actually expanding the internet access and connectivity through discussions people getting involved in INET uh, conferences. So this is picking up again. I think that's an important uh, issue that maybe you can give us an idea on. And also, uh, how is the mix between technical uh, training or training that is focused on technicalities of the internet versus how this imp um, impacts public policy uh, training in, in the internet? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and good morning everyone. Uh, I'd like to, to bounce on uh, what my colleague just said. Uh, it's really important to be able to touch the various communities um, and this multi-stakeholder approach which we've all described and which we understand the value of is really the keys of the success of those initiatives. Um, so for many years the Internet Society has been involved in technical training of course and I think this was uh, really um, at the very beginning in the history of the Internet Society, it's added value to the community. Um, with the years, we've also realized how important it was to train policymakers to reach out to new communities, to be able to involve people from civil society, the business community. And this is really 
um, a broad approach that we adopt for all our training and capacity building programs. So INETs uh, are a good example. They are uh, conferences, regional conferences. We organize um, three or four per year uh, on different continents. Um, this year, end of November, we're organizing one in uh, Doha, uh, 27th of November. So all the people from that region are absolutely uh, welcome to join. Um, and the concept of z these INETs are precisely to have policymakers, technical people, business community, civil society around the, ta the table. Um, and this innovative uh, approach has really proven to be extremely efficient. Um, and governments, business, locally, regionally, are expecting these conferences. So we're trying to develop them uh, further and further in, in, in the future. Um, another program I'd like to talk about, um, and which I had the, the pleasure to launch in, in 2009, was the Next Generation Leaders Program. Uh, we realized how important it was to uh, give a chance to young talents between 20 and 40 years old uh, to gather all these skills. And again, these skills have to be hybrid. We have a hybrid approach. Uh, we need to expose them to you know, the business challenges, the technical challenges, but also to gather diplomatic skills. Um, and we offer them through this program not only a chance to go through an e-learning program, which we've developed with Diplo Foundation, um, but also to gain uh, experience on the field. So we send people at the IGF, we send people at the OECD Development Forum, we send people at the uh, World Bank conferences, um, at the IETF, of course. Um, and the idea is also to have these young individuals from, from all these different communities get together. You know, young people from the business community exchanging ideas with future policymakers you're already building a community of people who have to talk together to make the right decisions in 10 years when they will be in charge, when they will be responsible. So that's really the, the whole concept of the Next Generation Leaders Program, which is a, a fantastic program. Uh, and we have now about 700, 800 alumni. Um, and it's, it's a community building up at a global level. Um, and now to talk about best practices, because I, I understand it was also in the framework of this workshop uh, what we, from this experience we've gathered um, in, uh, throughout these years, what we've identified to be the, perhaps the tricks, and I'm, I'm also here to, to, to listen about your tips on these capacity building programs, um, it's important to have a blended approach. Uh, policy, policy makers, future policy makers, it's kind of challenging, it's kind of uncomfortable comfortable for them to, to, to be, you know, technically challenged. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's good, and it's got to happen at an early stage, and they need to have this intellectual mechanic, uh, knowing that they don't know and everything. They need to have this reflex of going out to the technical community. And at the same time, the technical community, when we're building standards, we also need to be aware of the fact that there are some public interests. We need to have this sensitivity. We need to go back to the policymakers, to those who have been democratically elected. So this, this dialogue really needs to, to, to be ongoing, absolutely. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so, so I'm, I'm amazed, actually, that capacity building seems to be a win-win situation. It's, uh, it's not only something that um, uh, someone that is already well aware of the issues is just giving away, but it also it's probably a learning process of bringing all the stakeholders together. So um, that's an interesting thing. And I, um, uh, we were discussing um, uh, a few days ago that uh, to which extent can we go down to youth uh, with such programs and uh, one idea that was coming up is uh, it could be actually to a very, um, maybe an early university stage, go down with uh, things like, similar to the modern United Nations, maybe we can have a MUIGF, I don't know, something of that sort, where people actually sit and, uh, younger people sit and discuss ideas of what it is all about internet governance. So, uh, so Paul, do you want to come in? If I can comment on that. Um, actually, it, something very interesting came up yesterday in the Arab IGF uh, uh, workshop. Um, somebody from the, the European Commission, actually uh, somebody who works with a member of European Parliament, Dutch member of European Parliament, asked the Arab IGF panel what the EC could do to work together with the Arab IGF in, in, in providing some kind of support. 
and I had a little bit of a think about this, and I was on this panel, and I couldn't think fast enough to give back a, a great reply and latch on to their, to their support, but um, I do remember the person, so I will definitely grab them, because I did think about a fantastic initiative that probably moves a little bit in this area, and that is we had a very strong uh, youth uh, group inside the Arab IGF this year, and of course Eurodig has always been focused on, on, on youth, and uh, I was at the Eurodig meeting uh, this year as well, and they had a great uh, group of, of youth there. So I think uh, where money could be very well spent um, uh, in providing support uh, to the Arab IGF would be to pull these uh, youth together and have them organize a workshop or two together, Europeans with the, with the folks from the Middle East, with the Arab community, in getting a few workshops and let them do this together. There I can see kind of uh, gelling of, 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 of a different sort and them working together and then coming forward to government in Europe and in the Middle East and saying, hey, these are, these are the things that we think are important. And I think if we can enable something like that, then we're moving a little bit into this, into this category. And I think that, again, I think we have to use the power of these, of these IGFs because, of course, we have this global IGF. And, and, you know, as some of you may see, it can be a little bit chaotic sometimes. It's very difficult maybe to find where your place will be or where you can find that, that connection so that you can have something like a relationship to have capacity building going on. But the fantastic thing is, is that we're seeing these local IGFs happening, and we're seeing uh, different groups, different multi-stakeholder groups, certainly like the Internet Society and, and, and other groups that are getting involved in all of these regional IGFs and plugging in the things that can help things regionally. Because although I love getting together with, with everyone here on a, on a global platform, it's great to exchange, it's great to make good, good contacts. I think that good capacity building starts locally at home. And I think that these initiatives have to take place somewhere locally. So I think we have to use the power of things such as INETs and local IGFs to plug these kinds of, 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 of relations together so we can get the capacity building programs off the ground. Yeah, thank you so much, Bob. That's a great idea, I think. Okay, um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Silvia Cadena. Uh, Silvia is the project uh, officer at the Information Society Innovation uh, Fund, which uh, uh, grants uh, award programs supporting innovation on ICT in the, in the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, Sylvia um, has been involved in uh, building a strong and consistent internet presence uh, from civil society organizations around the LAC region, uh, specifically in uh, technical uh, training and uh, accessibility training. So, um, Sylvia, maybe um, uh, you can uh, speak to us about uh, funds on uh, one side and uh, uh, how it uh, helps uh, capacity building directives in that region but also maybe across uh, regions because uh, obviously you do have an experience uh, uh, across regions and how to get civil society also into the picture and hence expanding to uh, further community. Thanks Christine. Um, well happy to, to share uh, the cross-regional uh, population <laughs> experience. Um, look, um, I'm, I'm here wearing the, the hat of um, many organizations that have um, generously support the ECIT Asia uh, program uh, right from the start in 2008. Um, there is a little booklet on your desks um, with some of the information about what we have been doing in the past uh, few years and what are the plans uh, for the future. So um, ISIF uh, Asia, as Christine mentioned, is a grants and awards program. Um, we allocate a, a, a grants uh, on a competitive uh, basis to initiatives in the Asia Pacific that are specifically focused on innovation for internet development. So it's, um, it's what the donors will call a low risk uh, fund, which means um, that all the, the, the people that is uh, working on uh, developing applications or lobbying for the change in a specific law or trying to build uh, capacity building uh, mat uh, training materials or things like that um, can take the risk of doing it in a different way without someone trying to judge if they succeeded or not and if like if success uh, was the most important thing and not the process and the learning in the middle. So we are a fund that is uh, not averse to risks. Uh, we actually encourage it, and uh, if they failed, that's awesome. We just want to know why. 
and to understand what's happening in the process. We also have the grants, uh, the awards uh, initiative that what uh, is also allocated on a competitive uh, basis. Um, this year was uh, on five uh, different uh, categories. We have um, the winners are here at the IGF. We have our award ceremony today during the lunch break. So if you don't have, uh, if you can't find food and you're looking for something to do, join us. It's in conference room three at 12.30. Uh, we promise that would be cookies and maybe chocolates there. So <laughs> just in case. Um, that's the bribe <laughs> over there, so make sure they go you go there. So um, the, the awards, what, the, what we are looking with the awards is to acknowledge the contributions that uh, innovators in the region are doing uh, towards internet development uh, and help them to uh, be um, recognized by others and to, to be able to support them to scale up their projects. What we are doing is, um, uh, because we have the connections with some of the donors and the sponsors and partners, we are using our network to help them grow up and make and take the risk that, uh, that the fund allowed them to have with the little money that they were able to put uh, together their ideas. After they had their, that uh, R&D fund, then ca they can escala uh, scale up and build up on, that, on those learnings. Some of those initiatives have had uh, very interesting impacts already, which are uh, almost at the end of the, of the brochure. We have three very uh, nice examples of things that have happened in the region after they got $30,000. They were able to put together, for example, uh, an initiative that uh, uh, um, uh, um, supported the tsunami emergency services uh, in the Pacific and it was taken on, uh, on board by the Filipino uh, government and it has moved really far away from uh, how it started. So I guess it's just that seed of opportunity that we are uh, putting together. So um, one of the good news that we wanted to share with you all uh, today is that um, the we have started uh, in February this year an initiative called the Seed Alliance. It's an initiative where ISIF Asia, that is the grants program for, for the run by APNIC, the RAR in the Asia Pacific, uh, is doing with uh, FRIDA, the, which is run by LACNIC in Latin America, and then FIRE, which is run by AFRINIC in Africa. We are doing very similar things on as allocating grants and awards in different amounts, with different categories and different contexts uh, according to what we do in the regions. But on top of that, we are. Uh, we just uh, signed a new fantastic contract with the Swedish uh, government. We, we received a 1.5 million dollars grant to support not only more grants and more awards in the region, but a stronger capacity building exercise, where all the um, people that is uh, identified as a winner of uh, an award of as a or a recipient of a grant has the opportunity to uh, receive uh, extensive support to expand their network, to showcase their project and contribute to the discussions on internet governance or and the topics strictly allocated to their own uh, projects. One of those uh, funds is the possibility that they can uh, uh, re uh, request uh, specific uh, support, for example, to be able to pay the consultancy fees of someone to come and fix that little something that, uh, that they have been, been able to uh, sort out to apply for a specific trip or a specific uh, um, uh, attendance to a specific conference that they need or a training course that they need or a certification that they need to be able to move forward. To pay, for example, uh, um, in the case of many of the initiatives that are developed uh, by um, uh, community leaders in the small regions is the fact that they, they are very good at the technical bits, they are very good at the community engagement bits, but they don't have the business mind to put that into a business plan and make the case and make things sustainable and, and into the future. So it's like, okay, you can apply for this money to hire someone to help you build your business case and to move it forward or a trip to, a, um, uh, to participate, for example, in a round table where sponsors and partners and capital investors are. So those are kinds of things that are completely out of the scope of what an or, uh, like an RA, uh, work that RARs do, 
that's our contribution to development. So we are, um, of course, very committed to keep um, things going, but also the fund, because it's a competitive basis, basis it's running a competitive basis, it allows us to identify new things that are happening, um, new tendencies, new ideas that uh, people are interested to work on. So it's not us uh, imposing, oh, we should be working on health and apps, and it's, it's okay, what do you want to work on? And we build the categories based on the feedback we get. We allocate the funds based on the feedback the people, are how much peop uh, people is asking for. And after we uh, provide the grants and the support for them, we go hand in hand with them along the way, trying to support them to build their network and make their case. So they are not little projects that are just piling up in the drawer of someone, but are actually used somewhere else. Um, in the booklet, there is a little table in the middle of the book that um, is a, a very brief analysis of what we have been doing and who has received support. And one of the things that I really want to highlight is as uh, Paul was mentioning and other of the, of the panelists were mentioning, how important it is to build the capacity so the capacity stays in the country. One thing that we have identified with the fund is that international travel started in more than 30% in, in the budget that we used to receive before. Now it's less than 2%. So that means they, they, don't are, they are not bringing in people from anyone. Uh, they are not paying consultancy fees. And if you see the composition of the teams, nationals from the country, the project is going to be deployed as 97% of the teams are uh, structured by nationals of the country they are working. Only 3% are um, uh, people coming from overseas, which means that there is, you know, there is the talent there. There is the people that they just need us to, you know, get there and support what they want to do. Because what I, I used to work uh, when I was in, in Latin America, I was on the other side of the desk asking for money to do the little projects for the communities and the wireless networks for the communities and telecenters in Colombia back in 93. Uh, so we were the first, I ran the first telecenter project in Latin America after ISOC gave me training on one of the INITs back, back in a previous life. And uh, it's, it, it was always the case of the donor or someone else saying, uh, we have some money to do this. Can you write a proposal to do that? And then you have to accommodate your ideas and whatever you want to do to, to the whatever the donors want to do. And there was no interaction and no listening skills planned anywhere saying, look, yeah, but what we are trying to do is this. Yes, it's, it's right, but it's not the way you wanted to do it. It's this way. Can we try this way? And they were kind of reluctant to do it. So what we are trying to keep up doing it with is, if, uh, is to listen to what the people is trying to do and to take the risk with them and support them in, in, in that uh, fashion. So um, with the new uh, funds from um, the Swedish government, we have around almost $5 million to work for the next three years. And it's a lot of evaluation uh, uh, processes, a lot of grants, a lot of awards, a lot of capacity building exercises, but also, you know, have the money to decide where do you want to go. Yes, you put together your amazing Arab uh, uh, activities and the roadshow and, l and you have funds to do that. Well, not, not, not because the Asia Pacific can apply to that one, but I mean, if it was something like the roadshow for the Asia Pacific that Philip my boss is working on, then they can decide. We can apply for these grants to for capacity building and it's a, an extra couple of points that go into that pouch. So what we are, what we are uh, waiting or looking to have here at the IGF is as much input from people about what, what next what for next year, what categories, what what topics, what should, I, should we be investing on and who are the people that we don't know about that might benefit from this and to take things uh, at a um, more cooperation between the regions. So if someone is doing a project in Latin America that has little legs in Africa and Asia, they can apply for funds to uh, Frida, Fire and Isu and we will try to match the funds. So then it makes the little pouch a big pouch. So it's, it's trying to make the most out of the little funding we have. And um, we have been um, working really hard trying to let to, 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 so to donors to know that yes, 
the market is here, yes, the private sector is here, but that doesn't mean they can pull out all the funding, go away, and it's like everything, done, ICT for D, tick, and move to something else. Is there is still a lot of support needed from donors, from government, not only for the money they can put together, but for the recognition and the backup that if it's a completely different story when you have all these logos <laughs> at the end of some, some place, it's a different story what doors that open, that when you're just navigating, trying to get money to do something new. So uh, that's, that's um, the experience from ECPASIA. I don't know if I answer all your questions, but if, if anyone is interested uh, to, to know more about what we are doing and suggest things about how can we do it better and, and uh, wider and bigger, Please let us know, because well, that's what we are uh, here for. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. Yes, this uh, was uh, quite uh, interesting, and um <coughs> I'd call it hands-on capacity building. It's oh, yeah. actually <laughs> down-to-earth capacity building. And uh, and um, I, I would like to turn to the um, to the uh, other to the floor and to the participants. If anyone would like to have a question, we are open for uh, for any questions. <coughs> and. Uh, and also, if we have anything from remote participation, please let us know. Uh, maybe I want to um, uh, get back uh, on one issue that didn't get enough uh, of the discussion, but it's something that we actually wanted to explore. Uh, I mean, how, how can we actually measure if capacity building is actually um, expanding uh, the, the, uh, the use of the internet or the infrastructure uh, specifically in areas where we do want to see the internet more developed, where we want to get more users online. So uh, may maybe, Olga, you can yeah, come back on that. This is a very good question, and uh, it's very difficult. It, it's like when you raise your kids, you, s you think, what will happen with them when they grow up? But when they, when they grow, you have, you have the reward. My, my kids are, are not so young now, and I'm very happy what, what, I, what I did with them. But you don't know. And it's uh, it's you you are you are I cannot find the word apostar como se dice apostar into the future but into the future and uh, and you you do your best. What we did we have trained so far more than 300 uh, people in Latin America in the school starting from 26 and moving forward and this year it was 120. What we did is we tried to follow up what what they have been doing. Many of them went to the fellowship for uh, in ICANN. Many of them are very much involved in ICANN. So we did a list of them in into which uh, sporting organizations or into which um, advisor committee are they working in the GAC, in the GNSO, in the ALAC. Uh, some of them are, are also rising kind of leadership positions, like the president of La Grallo was a student in, in Sao Paulo and, and some other uh, examples that are, uh, are interesting if you want to know details about them. Um, so we follow them, and also what we try to do with the program, which is a tip, I think, or what wh it's what I like. It's not only training, it's that they get after the whole week a network already done with people from Europe, from the United States, and from the region, and from their country, because it's focused in the country, in the region, and, and global. So when they left the, the week, and what we try to do, and we invite the, 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 the the teachers and the faculty members to stay as long as they can. Of course, they are very busy, and sometimes they stay one day, two days. Some sometimes they are so kind to stay the whole week, so they they get related with them. And some of them are more interested in in technical issues. Some others are more interested in cybersecurity. So each faculty member can bring them a close um, feedback, perhaps in a coffee or in a lunch or in a social activity, and that has in my modest opinion, as much value as the program itself. Because when they finish, they know where to apply for uh, an ambassadorship in ISOC, because ISOC is also a supporter of the school. They uh, Then they know what to do, for example, to apply for a, for a seed uh, funding in uh, through LACNIC and through FRIDA, uh, because LACNIC is present in the program, or they know what is happening in, in Asia and Middle East and Europe through a RIPE uh, presentation and all that. So. Networking is is a, a good a, a good thing for them to have in their in their in their bag uh, as a result as an outcome. And so we, and we follow them. We, we try to follow them what they are doing. It's, it's not so easy because sometimes it, it the group is getting bigger and bigger and we are not so many. 
and the time is limited and this is not what I do for a living <laughs> so <laughs> but it's it's very nice it's very rewarding thank you thank you very much um, from a pragmatic point of view we've experienced that uh, to know what's going on in their life after they they've uh, benefited from our programs, uh, you actually simply have to tie them back to the program. Uh, they need to contribute. They need to contribute to the community. Uh, a first-time ambassador, if he wants to join the program again and be a returning ambassador, he has to be a mentor for uh, his little brother. And um, actually, that, that gives us a good track of their history. Uh, and someone like Tarek Kamel, who was former minister of Egypt, he's been through our programs. So he's easy to track because he was visible. But others, we can, we can know what, what they've been doing with this experience simply because we've asked them after the, the fellowship to give back to the community. And actually, I think it's a it's critical point because when you give back to the community, you actually experience the fact that to be a leader, you need to take care of others. It's not just your personal experience, I'm benefiting from a program and running wi away with it. You need to give back, and that's really all about leadership. Thank you. Yeah, th so actually re-engaging into those trainings that you've uh, gone through, this is a very important uh, take, I think. Um, yes, Ms. Um, in the case of the grant recipients, for example, that we support, is also the fact that the, the kind of reporting they have to do and the kind of documentation that they have to provide. Um, in a lot of uh, uh, grants programs, the, the report, the technical report, is something that you present to your donor and then the if, if, it, if it they fail, the donor decides to hide them a little and they don't share it publicly because it's, it's it you only share the good stuff, right? Um, in our case, what we are working on is um, public technical reports that go public, uh, technical reports that are fully documented, what solutions they put together, if, is a, if it's a software that they put together, they have to release everything, it's a Creative Commons license with commercial use, so you know, do it as you wish, make money with it, but you have to share what you did with the money you received. And that I, that I think is also, we, we encourage them to um, report on the lessons learned and we encourage them because that's part of giving back to the community, but we be giving back some meat to the community so they can actually do something with it. And uh, 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 the, the network that they built with uh, grant recipients and attending sessions like this um, and um, events like this, we try to support them to expand their network, but with something of substance that, that allows them to get um, to a level of recognition that is not the little guy in the corner that just came in for the first time is the little guy in the corner that is doing the, you know, kicking ass somewhere, and you have to know about him. Is is and is the obligation of other people to actually engage in that networking and, as I say, the big cookies over there, to go and talk to the little guy and say, look, the things that you're doing are awesome, and and can I learn from you? And it's not the other way around. It's not only. The, the big, the top level <laughs> domains saying, when you're, you know, what you, you should be doing and you have to learn from me, is, is that uh, obligation to engage with what others are doing and try to learn from them also. Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe another point that we're, are you, you wanted to get back on this point? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, if I, sorry, if I could, I wanted to touch on another point because I think everybody's, uh, and just to, to, to round some of these discussions up because I've got some frustrations in capacity building as well and I'd like to bring those, those forward um, because I can see some of the things that, that we're seeing and I, I, I know that you have these issues because I know we've spoken before about these and certainly uh, Constance as well with, with, with the Internet Society. But, you know, in, in capacity building efforts, it's really funny because most people always talk about money, money, oh, the money. In my experiences with this over the years of doing capacity building or outreach or networking, and I have to tell you, I think that my job description really is bring people together. I think if that's what it said, that's probably the only thing you have to write in my job description these days at, uh, in the work that I'm doing. Um, and it's funny because most people always take a, a look at the funding uh, and, 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 and they always see that as a constraint, you know, to like where capacity building goes. In my experience, actually, with any of the efforts I've been involved in, Money has never actually been the issue at the end of the day. 
there are much other frustrations that are larger than finding the money for this. And I wanted to bring these forward because I think that forums like, um, like, the, like the IGF or regional IGFs um, or any other kind of programs that you see like the Internet Society engaging in can bring uh, these frustrations a little bit down. And this is why, and this is actually why I run around and spend so much time trying to meet whoever I can at these IGF meetings because it's all about making the link. You see, because I think what's so frustrating is that, yes, I know everybody in the technical community and who and what resources I can tap into and who I need to speak with, but that's useless to me because I'm actually uh, speaking and preaching to the people that are actually already in my boat, you know what I mean? So that's not really moving me very far forward. I think that one of the big issues that I'm trying to get around, and which is what I'm trying to spend so much time on, is understanding and having other stakeholder groups uh, uh, understand how to tap into the expertise. This is an issue, and I think that bringing together that expertise and having that the, the ability to have an informal discussion, to bring that expertise together and see where you can get capacity building off the ground, then I see initiatives fly. Because it's only been through, actually, I have to tell you that in starting some of these things that I, I had happen in the, in, in the Middle East, it was really when I went to the IGF, I met Salam Yamut by happen chance. She was a government representative. I was uh, coming from the technical community. I met her by hap happen chance. We had a quick discussion. Boom. All of a sudden, we started the work. It wasn't a question about money. It wasn't a question about anything. It was making the link and bringing the expertise together. And this is, I think, one of the largest hurdles. And I actually think personally, that the IGF needs to concentrate much more on making sure that we bring these links together. That's where you'll see real capacity building happen. Thank you, Paul. So uh, bringing the right people, bringing the expertise together. So uh, <coughs> yeah, Salam, maybe you want to go in. I think it's going out of your comfort zone to reach. Uh, I think this is what it's all about, this because we all tend to be with people like us. But the challenge is to go and meet people that are not like us <laughs> and try to get a discussion. Uh, this and the other challenge you talked about, the following up for the capacity building, it's, it's very difficult, not in my capacity only as a government now official, but before that uh, as civil society member, uh, I've been involved in too many, many trainings. The problem also is the expectations because once the people are trained, they are not the same as when they are not trained. They, have, they want better jobs, they want better lives. And this is another, <laughs> this is another problem. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, and I'm, <coughs> since we're having um, uh, another 10 minutes yet to go, I, I would like to come back on another issue, which I thought was very interesting in, um, in Constance's uh, presentation, which is the blended and hybrid approach of, um, of training. And, uh, and uh, uh, we've all talked about different types of training. And I remember early trainings, uh, uh, in previous lives were all very technical. <laughs> we used to, you know, go uh, talk about routing, talk about IP addresses, talk about domain names, but that I believe has been a bit changing. So we hear more of components that are related to business uh, development. Uh, uh, we hear about uh, uh, policies more and more and, uh, and about uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, experience and how to negotiation skills. And so that all in addition to the technical. So given that we are having an exciting year to come with uh, the wicket and uh, with the and the next year is even more exciting. So uh, so how how do you think those um, capacity building programs have to really have a blended approach, not just uh, focused on one direction, in order to be able to pull the right expertise into? Because because when you get when you get the the, the people and uh, and you just give them one side of the story, they're either very acquainted with it or th it's completely uh, strange to them, and so it's it's really not that useful. So I would like to, uh, maybe to come back on that one. Thank you. Um, my my son and my daughter sometimes tell me that I'm an engineer that doesn't work as an engineer. My mom is an engineer, but she does this other thing that I don't know what she does, and that was my. So what I do now um, is doing what I've done all my life. I, I, I was trained as an engineer, but I in a moment I had to learn regulations because I worked developing the, the mobile networks in, in Argentina, the three of them. And then I had to learn businesses because the networks had to be, the service had to be sold. So I, I, I studied an MBA and then I 
I started to, to learn about this policy making when I became a, an advisor to the government of Argentina. And I didn't like that because I, was an, I, I studied engineering because I like mathematics and physics. But then I liked it and I realized that this holistic vision made me much more, uh, my, my thinking was much broader. So this is what I try to do with my students at the university. I've been a university teacher for 15 years. And I teach networking, but I try to bring them out of that technici technical box because it's so limited. So this I think this is the beauty of this IGF and these different uh, trainings that we do. We have to learn to be not only multi-stakeholder in, in a multi-stakeholder environment, but in a, a multi-stakeholder learning and teaching, which is not easy because each of us, we are trained in in, in in a specific uh, subject, so we are not multi. I'm not. I'm not a lawyer, but I had to learn regulations. So this is difficult, but we have to start from us. And once you once you can put it in, into you, and then it's easier to to bring it to others. And I finish with an example. When I came back to WISIS, from WISIS from Tunis to Argentina, I, I had a meeting with our minister, and uh, he said, "Well, that's that's nice. A very short." small delegation but you achieved many things and he said you have a suggestion I said yes you have to teach technology to the diplomats and he, s he liked it and he said oh that's interesting would you do that I said yes of course so three months after and since then we have a, a professorship in the diplomacy career of Argentina which is called technology introduction and I had a conversation with the first court one of the students came to me after the course and he said because we teach several things informative nanotechnology biotechnology ICTs and some other things and a half a year program and he came to me and said Olga when I saw the program I was very happy that um, I, I checked it with my wife and it was nanotechnology and, and I was happy that we were having teaching about babies and now I know that it's a fantastic industry that many developing countries are investing a lot of money and that's an opportunity for Argentina and Argentina has something to say about that and I said I'm so happy that you tell me this because this is exactly the purpose of this course to open your eyes thank you so when you're designing the summer schools uh, you actually have different dimensions all sorts of all of them it's very very broad and and uh, when we build a group of students we build them from a call for application uh, we try to build the group as diverse as possible. Lawyers, engineers, uh, politicians, uh, regulators, government, civil society, private sector, and as many countries as, as we can. If we have 10 from Argentina and one from Nicaragua, the Nicaraguan comes for sure. And Argentinians will be the second uh, priority because we have many. So we, we try to build the group as much as diverse as, as possible and the program as well. You can check that in, in the webpage. Thank you. Does anyone from the panel would like to come back on that issue of this hybrid approach? Maybe, uh, Paul, you want to... Um, yeah, Thanks, Christine. Sorry, maybe you, you, can, you, can tell the pe you can tell us how do you think those technical um, uh, trainings have actually affected policymaking, especially in the region. I mean, in the, in the Arab region, uh, uh, the, the, the wicked is happening uh, in one country that is in the Arab region. So how are the technicals? Because this blend of technicalities and policies is actually there inside, and it's... Yes. Okay, yeah, that's actually, that's very interesting. And I can say that uh, I have to uh, uh, agree with my colleague that said, you know, the training isn't just about training somebody to learn something. It is about bringing the people together because I can tell you that one of the reasons why we started the initiative that we did with uh, the technical community and government is because we wanted to get closer to the governments of the Middle East and we didn't know how to make that step. So the best thing was, let's give them our expertise and our technical training skills and we're going to get in there and we're going to understand what their issues are from the public policy perspective. Because again, you're talking about two very diverse areas coming together. So when you look at this hybrid approach, after we've seen that we've done these training courses, I can tell you we've got very fantastic relationships with the governments that we've actually had these things in. We've built them and through them we've met the other ones. This is the whole idea of the training. It's not just about what somebody's learning in that room because I actually attend these training courses myself and my scope there isn't to uh, isn't to you know provide any kind of training. I don't even have the expertise for something like that. 
my whole skill set lies in because I will meet who I need to from that government that we've actually teamed up with. And this, I think, if you look at, I, I, I think, initiatives that we work with, of course, our industry partner, the Internet Society, like, you know, the RIPE NCC is firmly planted in, in, into, the technical, I, into the technical community, but our work touches everything from civil society these days to the business sector. I mean, we've, we, we, we see that everybody is wanting a piece of what the RIPE NCC has and its expertise. So we actually, I mean, you know, teaming up with somebody like the Internet Society, the Internet Society already has that kind of hybrid approach, and it's got all the different facets inside its community, much wider than something like the RIPE NCC. So again, it's about like making the links and working together and seeing where this is. But what I can say is that um, even though we do build the links inside of government, I think one of the most frustrating things is, is that in, in a lot of countries, government changes hands quite quickly. And maybe other areas like the business community, or the technical community, tends to be a little bit more stable. And I think one of the frustrating things is, is that once I've actually gone to like a country like the UAE, where I'm living actually, and I have a very good step to, the, to their government and their regulators, I find that um, after I've spent time building a relationship with somebody, they move completely out of a department and they don't leave the intellect behind. And this is very concerning because it means that you have to start again from ground zero and you're working with a huge entity, an elephant really in my perspective, um, that you have to again start from zero in building that relation. And I think that this, this can be very frustrating. So where does that lead us when we're talking about real capacity building efforts or relationships in the multi-stakeholder arena? And so that's an interesting point, which is actually um, quite frustrating. <laughs> So I don't know if we don't have uh, further questions or comments from uh, the floor or the panelists. Maybe I can quickly recap, uh, and if you tell me if I've missed something, so that we can actually also report into the IG4D session um, on um, the discussion within this workshop. So I think points that were mentioned um, uh, range from um, uh, how to make the right links and how to get the uh, the right expertise and. Uh, and then the value of building um, an actual network and uh, maintaining uh, ties through that network with the alumni network of um, the ISO program and, uh, um, and, and the fund program was, uh, was mentioned. And then the hybrid approach of capacity building and training and how to actually keep that balance from the different uh, dimensions, but also the involvement of youth and um, as future leaders um, in capacity building. I don't know if I've uh, skipped anything uh, that you, uh, Chris, I don't know, you've been taking my own notes, that's fine. <laughs> okay, uh, with that I would like to uh, thank um, uh, all our participants and uh, thank our uh, panelists for the discussion. It's been a very interesting one and I hope uh, we can uh, take it further into the corridors. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.